and bitches. You can find this interview and more at our site, bnb.liberty.me, and also on Liberty Me's YouTube channel. My name is Tiffany Madison, and I'm joined by our other two hosts, Matt Gilliland, my partner in crime, super project manager with Liberty Me that basically runs all the things, and Lucy Steigerwald, host and producer of Politics for People That Hate Politics. She is also the author and founder of Stag Blog, and her work can be seen at Vice and Reason. We are welcomed by Ms. Whitney Davis, former president of Young Americans for Liberty at the University of Arkansas, and a master's student in electrical engineering at USC. She is an anarcho-capitalist that is passionate about free market principles, using technology, entrepreneurship, and charity to promote liberty. Ms. Jacqueline Boudreau is also joining us. She has done many awesome, awesome things, including working at a very interesting nonprofit, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, specializing in sexuality issues. She now hustles for the awesome organization Learn Liberty, and we'll be drinking, taking questions, getting into shenanigans, all that fun stuff. So welcome, everyone, and what are you drinking? I'll start. I got me some tin cup, American, Colorado. Woo! Cheers to you. I am drinking some North Carolina wine, and maybe some bullet bourbon. <laughs> oh, don't mix them. Don't mix them. <laughs> You'll regret. You'll regret. Uh, obviously not, like, at I the have same some time. Newcastle brown <laughs> ale. I usually have bullet bourbon today. I have Newcastle brown ale. I was going good with my bad food I was eating earlier. <laughs> just have wood, bitch. Leftover right. from last night, so. <laughs> Cheers. I'm keeping it really classy with my, uh, my boxed wine from Harris nice. Cedar and my mug to drink it in. So. Oh, <laughs> Cheers! I'm with you. Cheers! Cheers! <laughs> Woo! To episode four. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So starting off, we got a couple of things to uh, discuss. Um, really very interesting uh, topics, actually, especially for these ladies in this group here. So uh, starting off, Lena Dunham, which uh, full disclosure, I absolutely revile. So she's a Hollywood <laughs> and New York liberal darling, uh, talentless, that wrote, um, well, wrote recently in her shitty memoir that she used to pry open her one-year-old sister, Grace's, vagina and, quote, use any tactics a sexual predator would use against a young girl. Uh, she canceled her book tour because she's disgusting and was maligned by the <laughs> media. Uh, but the liberal media actually excused it as child play. I personally trolled her. Um, relentlessly on Twitter just to rub it in her face and there were a lot of people that were actually coming to her defense saying that it was just like playing doctor it was something that you know children basically do there was recently a salon piece that um, was published by a young man that basically did the same thing that Lena Dunham did but his mommy and daddy weren't rich Manhattanites from the privileged social class so he's now a sexual predator with a bracelet so what I wanted to find out I don't know who all here read the article but or who we in the audience has as well, but uh, do we have a double standard in this country regards, with regards to how we perceive sexual abuse from men and women? And if so, what do we do about that? How do we actually change that? I think yeah, we I... absolutely have a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Jacqueline. <laughs> I mean, we see this time and again with uh, teacher-student scandals and sort of this, this idea that... Uh, women are, are victims, men are predators. Um, but I think an even sort of larger question is sort of the role of, uh, the role of prison and how we, how we solve like these sort of issues. And the fact that we throw children um, in prison, like behind bars, he actually described his experience like living in a cell um, for, for something as a child. Um, I think it's really interesting that that's how we deal with the issue. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a much larger question than even just uh, the gender differences. Why do you think that is? And, and, and the reason why I'm curious as to what you ladies think about that is I've, I've gotten the vibe from like my more conservative family members that the stuff that's on television, the, the teen type of you know, skins, I don't know that show if you guys ever saw that, my nieces were watching it one day, and I walked in. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is like soft <laughs> porn. 
You know, like <laughs> I, I, I listen to rap videos. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, I don't see nothing wrong with a little bump and grind. I heard all that growing up too. But like a lot of what you see now in media and in 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 actual music is super super sexualized. So it's curious to me that they would treat one gender differently than the other. Where did that come from? I don't know if it's just the gender differences. Uh, honestly, I, w I would halfway defend Lena Dunham on this one, which may shock each and every one of you. Um, Dunham drives me nuts because she's moderately talented and she is so appallingly narcissistic and so convinced that everything that she has to say is just the most special, shareable wonderfulness. And that's what I just like about her most of all. I think she's moderately talented, albeit incredibly overrated. But uh, the Salon piece, actually it's on Salon, well, I should give, we should give them credit for that kind of non-terribleness. The guy who touched yeah. his sister inappropriately, though, like, I mean, the, 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 this, this makes me think of privilege, okay? Lena Dunham has privilege in that she didn't get thrown in jail for three years for inappropriately playing with her sister, which does actually happen, and I, I think that, I suppose, sometimes abuse and inappropriate doctory play, there's a narrow line there. I haven't read the memoir, I don't know the full context, I'm not going to pretend I know what happened. But, you know, Dunham didn't get tossed in jail for three years, that's what it comes down to. But instead of um, acting, as, uh, which is what conservatives have been doing, acting like maybe she should have been thrown in jail for it, I, I would like to refute the privileged garbage narrative and focus on the dude who did get thrown in jail and shouldn't have been, not like act as if Dunham should have been tossed in jail too. Fair enough. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I feel like that's kind of what Jacqueline was saying, was that throwing people in jail isn't really the answer for that. Because, you know, they're kids. Were they actually taught about sex at that age? Do they know what they're doing? Is, do they know that that's yeah. wrong? So to me, that's kind of the issue. Is it's a really thin line because it comes down to different parenting styles and if, if they actually know what they're doing. And we yeah, teach children not to really hit each other too, right? Like that would be that would be assault as an adult. Um, but they still do it, right? And nobody throws them in jail for, for assault. So I think taking adult policies for people who have had some exposure um, in education and sort of understand um, you know the the consequences of these sort of things. I think it's a lot different for children who don't understand how um, sexuality can can affect a person um, and how those sort of experiences can cause like, you know, really detrimental psychological effects. If they're not educated in it, I don't know how we expect them to know the difference between punching their friend in an arm when they're not supposed to and playing with their sister when they're not supposed to. Yeah, yeah I think the really bizarre thing about Lena Dunham was not so much what she did, but how she framed it as an adult. Yeah. Um, it was just weird. And had she been anyone else, that especially wouldn't have gone over well. Like, it gave her enough heat as it is. But, like, I, I mean, yeah, she framed it as jokingly that she was a sexual predator, but, like, it was a bad joke. At the very least, it was a bad joke that she should have known better. <laughs> the oversharing just repulses me. Like, that's what repulses me, <laughs> they say. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, her sister doesn't view it as, like, assault. She doesn't view it as molestation. So I think there is something to be said there. But just, yeah, the framing, the framing was weird. The framing was gave me the creeps. Yeah, I didn't like how she tried to blame it, uh, people's reactions to her own words on the right-wing media. It was an attempt mm. to, you know, as you said, Meg, normalize her own behavior. Um, you know, and what one-year-old cognitively plays a prank on their own family by placing pebbles in her own private areas just to mess with them? I mean, maybe it was... That didn't make any sense, honestly. Yeah, I, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, um, yeah. So, and again, she's a self-proclaimed unreliable narrator. narrator. Um, so it could have been a complete fabrication, but you know, and I also read a piece about her poor sister stating that basically Dunham sees her as an extension of herself and has no bones about revealing super personal information about her family members. So that's a self-absorbed malignant narcissist if you've ever seen one. 
Um, I think her yeah, own self-descriptor of sexual predator was what really, really pissed people off. Um, and it, to me, yeah. it's an insult to victims everywhere. Um, you don't, you know, you, you don't get to talk about yourself being like, I don't know, I don't know the rape victim thing. I, I'm just kind of going on a, a different element there. But the whole scene that she described is awkward sex. If you want women to have agency, you need to give, you know, this is what I did wrong, and this is why it made me uncomfortable, and this is why I regret it. Immediately taking the, you know, words out of someone else's mouth and then calling it sexual violence really bothered me. And I don't, maybe it's because I know victims of true sexual abuse and assault. It really bothered me that she tried to spin that, you know, uh, tale instead of just saying for what it was. I was awkward, uncomfortable, and wasn't really sure of myself. It was now all of a sudden rape. Am I the only one who's... Yeah, really I don't know what she was trying to do. Like... I Sorry, guys, I was just, like, you know, channeling my inner sexual predator right there. Like, I don't understand, like, why she yeah. makes such light of that. Yeah. Or, and if she really I mean, did see it as something to make light of, like, why is she not an activist making sure that, like, other people realize that this isn't something we should be throwing children in jail for? It seems like she's making herself the exception to the rule. Because she needs to talk about voting and how voting makes you feel good all over and talking about like how the sex offender registry is shitty would be much too important and you can't have narcissistic liberal feminists doing that because that's so fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish that um, liberal feminists though would have actually been honest with themselves about her very unreliable narrative instead of coming to her defense. Although I do like it because it just undermines their credibility they never had to begin with. So I always enjoy when that happens. <laughs> Uh, are you any of you fans? Have you ever watched um, any of her, that girls show or whatever? I watched maybe 20 minutes of it and wanted to stab out my eyes. I couldn't yeah, I have, I've never watched girls. I grew up on Sex and the City and girls is like the exact opposite of Sex and the City from what I understand and I just, I'm not interested in that. I watched I, two seasons of it and I don't like it and that's apparently how much time I have to get <laughs> <laughs> not both. I didn't know who I she was. <laughs> I didn't know who um, she was until this not. came out. So, God bless you. And <laughs> I'm a sheltered <laughs> child, I guess. <laughs> like it's moderately amusing occasionally. Like I think she's moderately talented, but again, horrible narcissist, navel gazing just to the absolute <laughs> million power and. Maybe if she stopped that, she would, you know, become less insufferable. Yeah. I, I'm pretty I, sure even fans of the show don't like Lena. Like, I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's a thing as well. <laughs> Everyone on the show is awful. That's what, what bothers me about that show fundamentally is that all of those people are unpleasant, but in a really banal sort of way. Like, if you're going to have an anti-hero, like, let's have, um, you know, Breaking Bad and... Uh, Jesse Pinkman being redeemed, something interesting and like not of our lives. Insufferable millennials, like aren't we that? No, we're great. <laughs> I love us. But, like I don't get the appeal. Fair enough. That's that's a good point. Awesome. Well, um, I I despise her so much. I don't want to waste our gray matter on her any longer. Um, so a second Fair topic enough. that's actually um you know kind of again raising the internet today. Uh, speaking of Salon, which I think this is the only time in my life I've spoken about them so much, because um, I really <laughs> despise them as well, uh, but a writer recently raised a Twitter shitstorm by writing a piece stating that worshipping soldiers perpetuates this mythical narrative of the soldier as this, you know, um, courageous hero, and that encourages more people who come from places that maybe they feel like they don't have another opportunity to go into the military, which, given our disastrous foreign policy, continues to feed uh, the war cannon. Um, I think the actual sideline was, uh, stop worshiping so stop worshiping soldiers. You don't protect my freedom. Our childish insistence on calling soldiers heroes deadens real democracy. It's been 70 years since we fought a war about freedom. Forced troop worship and compulsory, compulsory patriotism must end. What say you? It's really hard for me to disagree with that. As much as I hate Salon and kind of hate the writing style and take issue with some of the points, the fundamental premise 
And that's mostly why I stay away from Twitter today, because I knew I wouldn't be able to help myself. I kind of agree with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree too. <laughs> you know, judge, judge people by the individual. I mean, that. I don't know how hard that is. <laughs> that's, because I only read the first part of the article because I was really busy today. But, um, you know, I, I completely agree with what I read at first because whenever you judge people by a group, then you excuse all the bad things they do. It's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm an anarchist, so I kind of, I'm kind of against collectivism. And so whenever you group people um, and you glorify them for whatever they're collectivized by, like being, you know, someone in the military, which my brother-in-law is in the military, so I'm not hating on anyone in the military, but um, you kind of excuse them for any bad things they do, and I just think that's a slippery slope. I'd be really reluctant, and I think most people would, to say that there have never been heroes, or there aren't heroes in the military. Um, there are obviously people who have fought for freedom in the military. Um, you know, liberators in World War II. Like, there, there are plenty of examples we could point to. I think the problem is is that we we glamorize the outfit. We glamorize the, the status so much that it makes us really reluctant as a society to, to question what they are fighting for in the wars themselves. And I think that that's really unhealthy um, because, at least for me, the second I start talking about, like, not supporting the war... I've definitely heard people be like, oh, well, if you don't support your troops, like, you know, who are you? Um, and it goes immediately from not supporting the war, not supporting, like, what they're doing to, oh, you don't support that person. You think that person is bad. Um, and I think that that sort of glamour is really, really unhealthy to have for, for a person. Yeah, absolutely. And I personally think that supporting the troops is not supporting war. Because if you support war, you're supporting the troops being slaughtered for no fucking reason. I think that's true, but I also can't say that I support the troops because that's also sort of a meaningless platitude, depending on who's saying it. I mean, it, it's a less dangerous one than, you know, being angry because someone wants to criticize foreign policy. But it's still like, what does it mean? It's going to mean different things to different people. Um, in defense of some troops, um, my friend JL, who was in the war in Iraq, like, doesn't, you know, he's not, he knows he wasn't a hero. Um, Andy Levy on Red Eye, a very moderate libertarian, especially for this crowd, has ta talked about, I swear, a different Salon shitstorm military article, where he also said, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I was sitting around the DMZ in North, uh, South Korea, not a hero. Like, there are plenty of soldiers who have a lot better nuance of the situation than any of the flailing freaks on Twitter do. Yeah. Um, wow. Woo! Uh, <laughs> where do I go with this? Um, yeah, so uh, I actually, for those who don't know, I volunteered, uh, ran a nonprofit for Wounded Marines. Father is a veteran of the Vietnam War, uh, married to an active duty soldier who uh, eventually will uh, find his way out. Um, and I, am, I live in a military town, so I just moved here in February. I'm surrounded um, by, by people that are in the military. Um, in my experience as a former counselor with veterans that were suffering from very severe post-traumatic stress, there, when people say, you know, don't glorify the troops, they're classifying a million people into this like collective group and there's a lot of different individuals from different backgrounds and different mindsets and experiences that define a soldier so to me when i think of what these guys are saying i agree from a philosophical point and what i think and i'm going to be completely honest here is the type of soldier that stayed behind the wire maybe didn't actually go see combat probably never fired his gun or saw a shot come at him that goes into like an IHOP and expects like gratitude or for people to buy him dinner. Like I see that a lot. Um, in contrast, I'm around the quiet, stoic type that will never talk about their accomplishments because they don't see it as accomplishments. They see it fighting for the man to the left and to the right. Most of them see it as a pointless war that accomplished nothing. Um, some people feel that that eats at their soul. Some have reconciled it in the old ways that they can. 
Some struggle with it every day. Some suck start a pistol because they can't deal with it anymore. So there's a, you know, there's a way to talk about that specific asshole type, and veterans do that very well together. Um, they will align somebody that um, speaks as if they are deserved some form of recognition or some really, really high honor because they served overseas. Um, the other kind that doesn't ever talk about their valor or what they've done, um, again, defending their man to the left or the right, doesn't, you, we can't just say, hey, don't, don't say that they're not courageous, don't say that they haven't acted in valor. Um, the war was unjust. I can't say, argue otherwise, and I don't think any of them will either. Um, in fact, I would argue that it hurts them, that it's not. And when you come up and thank them for their service or thank them for their freedom, for protecting your freedom on a day like today, it, it almost is, it hurts, you know? Like, don't thank me. Like, what did I, you know what I mean? It's almost like a, what did I, did I, are you thanking me for your freedom to be completely ignorant as to what went on over there? So yeah, I <laughs> a lot of, yeah, I, I mean that. Like, I've caught mm -hmm. looks of, of veterans and, and soldiers and Marines doing that. So yeah, I think, there, um, like you said, there's a, there is a lot of nuance and there's a lot of different groups there that can catch that nuance. And so to me, it's so layered and so um, complicated because I'm on the total opposite side of it. Um, but overall, the overarching understanding, I, I totally understand. And um, I didn't take too much of an issue with a lot of his points. I actually agreed with, with a few of them, too. So I don't know what people were freaking out about. Um, I, again, it was uh, written in an insufferable kind of Solani style. I'm, I've written that article and I've done it better. Like I'm just going to say that right now. Um, <laughs> and I've done that. Like like he he ends it m mentioning um, you know bumper stickers and stuff. And I think that like that that's the thing that I tend to use as well. And I know I didn't invent that, so I'm not going <laughs> to. But um, you know it's not a bumper sticker issue. Support the troops. Oh well, war is just summed right up there. Um, but I, worse still though. I mean at the at the end of the day, like I I'm not interested in. Um, a kind of libertarianism or ANCAPism that, you know, goes around going like, fuck you, soldier, baby killers. And there are people like that. Um, there are people like that. But at the same time, every soldier, even the ones who are really regretful about it, they were part of an institution that is devoted to some very unlibertarian ends. And that doesn't mean that we have to cast them out and say, you're never forgiven, or that, like, every interaction with them is like, Grr. but at the same time, like, even even what Tiffany says is a little too gentle for me at this point, um, but it's something I struggle with because I've been reading history since I was this tall. <laughs> yeah. Um, even if I... Well, I was going to say, Whitney... Um, even if... Oh, go ahead. I think we have a little bit of a delay. Your page is, like, one of the first pages that I've seen that, like, you really handle this really, really well. How do you how do you handle that? I do. <laughs> I, I always <laughs> thought it wasn't that tactful. <laughs> Because I, I was going to, because, um, well, I think, because I think it's on the same level as police brutality, well, not on the same level, um, but, you know, they glorify policemen as well as military men, and so I deal a lot with police brutality, and, you know, I live in Los Angeles, and it's some of the worst, it's the one of the worst police departments in the country, honestly. Um, so I have a friend from high school whose mom was a cop and, you know, she was really nice to us and then I lived in a small town so it's really kind of hard for me to say, yeah, screw all those cops, blah, 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 but at the same time, they kind of suck. So, <laughs> so I'm really trying um, to stress that, you know, I'm not against defense. And I'm not against individuals who actually want to protect their family or their communities um, because, you know, I, I believe you should be able to form a private security company if you want to. Uh, so that's something I try to stress, but I didn't know. I appreciate that. I didn't think I was that tactful because I was about to say that I really want to troll a lot, but I hold back because I want to say stuff like, you know, thanking my doctor or thanking, like, an engineer for my car and my phone and, like, totally, you know, totally. thanking all these different people for making my life easier and better every day. But I know that's probably not the best way to reach conservatives or people that think like that, but I, I might do it someday. 
just because. Well, um, definitely. You're, what, what, <laughs> let me clarify. So what Lucy said was really, really um, on point based on the stuff I've read on your page. So I should have been more clear. So Lucy basically said <laughs> that when you're an and like if you have and cats that are super aggressive and are like, oh, a baby killer, like I just had a conversation about it. Um, under anarcho-capitalism today. Like, I've seen more soldiers come to the libertarian, from constitutional to the libertarian side under Ron Paul than any other group. Like, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. And every time they're at my house, we are talking about war. Every time. Mm -hmm. I am freaking foreign policy, we're going off, right? So, <laughs> Angela Keaton, when she came here and stayed the weekend, had some of the best conversations oh. with soldiers. So, yeah. So, but what, what Lucy touched on is really important. Like, you have um, kind of given some really classy rebuttals back to super hardcore, rabid, aggressive ant caps that are like, fuck soldiers, they're all welfare wars, you know, you got to call them out for what they are. And your rebuttals have been very tasteful, and actually that's not the best way to reach them. Yeah, and as I said, you know, my brother-in-law is in the Air Force, so... I completely understand where these people are coming from. Some of them, you know, they don't know what they want to do with their lives and they join the military because they're promised all these wonderful things and then they're denied them afterwards because it was all a lie. So I know a lot of people in the military and it's just, I can't, you know, I, there's a lot of ANCAPs out there that want to break ties with anyone that wants to violate the non-aggression principle or support any kind of statism or anything like that. And it's just you're making more enemies that you don't need. So I don't understand. I think it's just one of those ego things. And I totally understand because I get a little arrogant on my page sometimes. But, you know, if you really want to make a change, <laughs> just kind of take a breath and you know, try to reach someone on a personal level, I guess. I guess they need, just need to get out a little bit. <laughs> there. Lucy, what were you going to say? Sorry. Actually, uh, go on. Go on. This actually um, transcends sort of my anarcho-capitalist views a bit because I think if we had private military and there were, like, teams of mercenaries um, who trained in the exact same way that our military trains people to just follow orders and not question, um, then I probably wouldn't support that company. I probably wouldn't support that mercenary group. I think we take a lot of people who could be adding value to society in a really great way, and we sort of stamp, stomp that out of them. What I'm not sure, and I might be sort of ignorant here, is is that like a necessary strategy for training individuals to protect other people. If it is, then okay, maybe it's justified. But if it's not, then I also just strongly disagree with the way that we prepare men for war. And I think that that's why police brutality is becoming such a big issue is when you take those same strategies and start applying them to police forces, um, the same sort of training ideas, that's when you start getting them not questioning, pulling the trigger and harming innocent people. Yeah, I, I think that questioning is kind of necessary even in an anarcho-capitalist situation where you would have these mercenary groups. But there may be instances where you kind of have to follow orders, but I think that really like you need to have principles at the foundation, and that's what's lacking in the military right now. Um, it's a really, really, in my opinion, unprincipled organization. Um, and Tiffany, you may want to chime in here. You may have some insights that we don't have just given your experiences and your conversations with veterans. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest problem is that principle is not at the foundation. So if you had a situation- Or accountability. Where you were, or accountability, yeah, there's absolutely none. Um, yeah, so that's my kind of view on it. Yeah, I would take a Wait. off, I would, go ahead. I was going to actually just ask, what is the military's job? Like, what, what, is, like, what is their purpose? Protect <laughs> our freedom. Like, like, yeah. I mean, like, you're going to get a bunch of different answers to that. Um, Build bridges in Iraq that are later blown up. Or just <laughs> kill brown people, as someone in chat just said. Yeah, that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like... Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, what is there? What is their role? I mean, it depends on the, the theater, and I think they're in 150 different locations all over the world. 
So it, it kind of depends on on um, you know where they're where they're located. Uh, Meg, I would only take um, I would only have one issue with what you said in regards to uh, accountability or principles. So, and I actually had a really really heated debate at the bar down here. Weird with a decorated uh, veteran, Ken Rudo. If you're listening to this, which I'm sure you will, the journalist here, Rules of Engagement. Anyway, um, we have this now little standing beef where we argued over the rules of engagement. He argued that the rules of engagement made it to where um, soldiers actually acted within the confines of very strict rules, which prevented them from becoming crazed by war. Okay. My opinion, based on all of the individuals that have told me this directly, he's the, literally the only opinion I've ever heard that, that says that, is that the rules of engagement are so ridiculous because the goal is not really to win the war, it's to keep us there indefinitely. So the rules are, hey, you see a guy planting a bomb on the side of the road, grab him, you know, test his fingers, even if he tests positive, we're going to keep him for 72 hours, then we're going to feed him, clothe him, and release him. And then the guy is now your enemy. So is he enemy or not? You don't wage war half-assed. You don't have people go and leave their homes and their families for a year and, and ask them to take bullets and ask them to build schools and infrastructure and entire power plants, as Vice reported, which are going to be completely and absolutely neglected after we're gone. That's just a racket. It's all a racket. There's really no purpose to it. And that's why it's half war. So the rules of engagement are super, super strict. So there is accountability there to the point that it actually hampers the war effort because we're not really at real full tilt war. And that's what really bothers these guys more than anything is because, you know, the conquered don't want them there. They don't want to be there. America is broke. And until they're out, it's never going to stop. Most of them hate the Afghans. The Afghans hate them. And anyone who said otherwise really hasn't been beyond the wire. I mean, trust is gone. And I'm talking specifically about Afghanistan. So, you know, now we get blowback situations, which is pure McChrystal math, you know, where he basically said for every innocent you kill, whether it be by drone or um, some, you know, wrong uh, collateral damage, if you will, is 10 people back that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be mobilized to come and fight you. So unless you're then able to go full tilt against those 10 people instead of only shoot when you're getting shot at after a bullet to graze you, I mean, the rules of engagement are ridiculous. So there's over accountability when it comes to actually fighting the war. And then for the people who do a half-assed job, there's no accountability. There's a lot of cover-up. And that's what makes the entire thing feel very futile for a lot of these soldiers, which freaking well, eats them alive. It eats them alive. That's that's the thing about wars, though. All the shittiest U.S. wars could have been worse. I mean, it, the Vietnam War killed 2 million Vietnamese people, like 60,000 um, so American soldiers. I don't remember how many were drafted, but presumably some of them joined up so they could pick their branch anyway. Um, America could have just nuked everywhere. They could have burned down every village. I mean, you could always be worse at war, but what we tend to get is this hellish... Um, stalemate or and or quagmire where like thousands upon thousands of people die but you ha leave enough survivors to resent you forever and, and and make some blowback so you know i don't know it's just we, we well, the, the, oh. yeah and, and just to clarify too i don't think like total war blitzkrieg is ever like a good standard for anything what i mean is if you're if you're gonna send people in to occupy and train a foreign military and then fight insurgents i mean that whole system, I mean, everything from coin to I can't even think of a strategy there that's been anything that's remotely successful. It's just one failure after another because the intent is, is to not really actually fight a war. It's to skirmish and retreat, skirmish and retreat, hold this place for a couple of years and then retreat. I mean, it almost is comparable to Vietnam. My father would tell me stories of them losing, you know, 5,000 guys to take a hill. And then some asshole in Washington, some bureaucrat, would say, okay, you know, just like Paul Brimmer did when he disbanded the Iraqi military, or uh, some other, you know, Washington asshole, the Kagans, when they would, you know, advise on uh, Afghan foreign policy. Okay, well, now we've got to give it back to the Afghan National Army. I mean, these people don't even, they wipe their ass with their left hand. They can't operate, like, you're, you're trying to literally spoon feed democracy. <laughs> No, I mean, seriously, like you're trying to spoon feed democracy that took Western man thousands of years 
to people who are entrenched in tribal warfare. They don't care. And look what he fucking did with it. He used it to go invade Iraq. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, Western Enlightenment doesn't have some superiority for those of us who live in these countries, but uh, don't get too impressed with democracy in the West. Because oh, I'm not. I'm not. But don't don't shut it down at the barrel of a gun to people who have no concept of that. Like it's it's so stupid and asinine that we're not only still there, but we'll end up being there till 2024. I mean, that's what I mean by full tilt war. If you actually have an objective, go in. There's no reason for the entire United States military to ever occupy that country. Go get send your, send your special forces, your special operators, send them in there. And get them to secure Bin Laden and seize him, or do whatever it is that you allegedly hey. went in there to do. You don't Tiffany, need to actually invade. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we need to debate. It's okay. That's that's our safe word or something. I don't know. <laughs> hey, I get I get I get super passionate on this subject. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Lucy. Though is is you know, one thing that we really have to make sure that we try to pressure is to keep us out of the rest of these conflicts. I mean, every five seconds, it's a friggin', you know, it's got to be Iran or it's got to be, you know, Syria. And now with this ISIS thing, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a never-ending quest to make sure that we are in almost every Middle Eastern country occupying, pillaging, and dying on their soil. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a clusterfuck. Cheers to that. Woo, American <laughs> foreign policy. Woo. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I just wanna, if that's really awesome, Peterson right there uh, commenting. He's really distracting, and how much I want to yell at him. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Doing a bang up job. Feel that. free to yell at him. Yeah. 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 Troll away, good sir. Troll away. He will. He's already been asking all the <laughs> around everybody up. <laughs> God bless you. Austin, you're Wait, my favorite. I can't it's definitely him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, uh, so, what's our next topic, Tiffany? Uh, net neutrality. Did you guys want to? Oh, did you guys want to do net neutrality? No. <laughs> Come on. I have nothing. So I, no words. Okay, hold on. I have to bring this up. So, Ted Cruz okay. today. Ted Cruz said that he compared net neutrality to Obamacare. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys have seen the oatmeal cartoon. No, he's so serious. He's so fucking serious. So, oh, um, and by the way, after this, I have to ask Jacqueline about sex robots. So, sorry. Yeah, that's going to be a recurring theme on this uh, on this web series, right? Sex uh, robots. Sex robots. The entire um, revolutionary concept for that, um, especially in terms of male female relationships and marriage and childbearing and the survivability of the human race. I don't know. Um, but anyways. So if you guys have not seen, uh, which again, um, Ted Cruz has a weird face. He really does. I'm sorry. <laughs> but awesome. If you guys have not seen this, so um, Mary Marianne is Mary Copenhaver is the first person who brought that to my attention, and I will never ever see this normal ever again. So you have to, you guys have got to look at that oatmeal post about net neutrality, where he basically completely disassembles it. Um, I, I mean, I get asked, I know Julie Brownski's in here, and she, she got asked, I saw her post today, everybody wants to know what everyone thinks about net neutrality, and it's so it's complicated, like, I, I really don't even know where to begin. I mean, I just took a, I took the talking points from the EFF today, to even generally understand it. Does anyone have a better understanding than I do? I won't only, won't only touch on it. If you read the EFF, probably not, because they okay. know about I love things. those people make out with their yeah. website every day. <laughs> love it. I read about it like when it first started and yeah, it's complicated and I actually took a networks class. So <laughs> all I can say is that to me it it I would be against it just because it seems like government regulation of it um, because there is a monopoly in the first place with the ISPs in a particular area and so to me the solution would be get rid of the monopolies because really if you I equate it with other markets that's kind of how I try to figure out my principles so 
Um, think of a supply chain for any other company like Walmart or any other superstore or something like that and say that they refuse to, because the issue here is Netflix supposedly. So say that a big company like Walmart refuses to sell a certain product that a lot of people want because it takes so much time, it takes so many resources to get into its stores. And so that would mean, and then the government gives Walmart the sole ability to provide that particular service. Um, um, so that would mean that you're advocating for the government to force Walmart to sell this product instead of just opening up competition so that other stores can sell the product. Because what happens is Netflix takes up a lot of data usage, a lot of bandwidth. So mm -hmm. it's going to take, um, you know, the infrastructure needs to be replaced to where it can support that kind of bandwidth or prices will fluctuate. Just like this happened with whenever cell phones, I'm reading a book right now, so I'm kind of excited about it. <laughs> it's about smartphones and I'm a nerd. Um, Whenever we switched from regular phones to smartphones, our data usage went up significantly. And so cellular uh, mobile device, um, sorry, mobile service providers had to adjust accordingly because they didn't have, they weren't used to that much data being used. And so they switched their plans, they charged people more money, and you know, they worked around it. And so that's really what this is. And to me, um, I could be wrong on some parts of the bill, but to me, it just seems like a government in of trying to monitor or regulate um, the flow of traffic between the ISP and the consumer. Because as of right now, they've mainly gotten their information like with the NSA from data centers, just confiscating information from Google and Yahoo. So to me, it just seems like an end for government to be able to track the communication straight from like your laptop to your internet service provider. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, nice. I mean, we know how really shoddily, <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> like the, the phone monopolies back in the day with AT&T didn't exactly um, work out well for communication. Like I don't. It, yeah. I don't. Yeah, because there's <laughs> licensing too. So, um, you know, that's another government monopoly with the cellular side too. Is they had to hand out all these licenses, and it put us behind in the global market. Yeah, from what it's, I understand, the EFF is isn't it the FCC that like passed something in 2002? where they would treat broadband as like an information service rather than a telecommunication service. So, I mean, it, the triviality of the bureaucracy are, are, are ridiculous. But I, from what I read, it, because of that classification, they can impose regulations that promote competition, which is good, but they can't stop providers from giving cronies, business partners, special interests, whoever they want, to you know, bestow the gift of special access in terms of users seeking it. So I think they did this with Netflix. I was, again, getting my information from the oatmeal. <laughs> but it was a really, really informative <laughs> cartoon where he actually broke it down. And he, he like seriously broke it down and said, you know, you don't, you don't think that companies like Comcast will actually do this. They totally will. And how they fucked with Netflix over it. And I posted the link in there. Um, everybody should take a look at it. But, he says, uh, last year Comcast demanded Netflix pay them millions of dollars or they were going to slow down internet speeds of customers who were trying to stream Netflix movies. During contract negotiations, Comcast throttled the bandwidth of Netflix users in order to bully Netflix into paying massive fines. And it worked. Netflix got so many complaints on social media that they caved during the negotiations and the bandwidth strangling basically did its job and Comcast was forced to pay, or Netflix was forced to pay more. And there's like this epic chart that shows like how their negotiations are, and then the full throttle speed, and then boom, 
So yeah, it's total yeah. manipulation of the it, it to me, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, do you guys know anybody who's That's pro net neutrality? Um, Sorry. There's quite a few people on my Facebook that are, but I don't. My American I just, I just want to say one thing. Is. <laughs> I'm kind of pro net neutrality because we don't have at all anything even resembling a free market when it comes to ISP providers. So given that situation, I think that yeah. net neutrality makes sense. That's kind of what Otherwise, he says. I just, would not I, just want, I just want I just yeah. I just wanted to say that that does happen. That is completely what happens, but because of the monopoly in local areas. And honestly, I would just leave it alone, either clear it like either quit repeal any government licensing and monopolies, which I highly doubt that will happen, or leave it alone and let Google Fiber come in and just completely change um, the, the structure of um, internet service. I think they're going to revolutionize everything, so. Are you yes, familiar with Google Fiber? Sorry. Okay, cool. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I had that in Dallas, and now I have country ass internet um, out here from Oh Charter. my god, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did not know you came from Google Fiber to yes, visit yourself. I'm from no. Dallas! <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> the beautiful Texas metropolis. I come from Google Fiber, I had no issues ever, ever, no problems. And then I'm like, like, I have a delay right now. I have been conditioned since fucking February to literally just accept a relay into my head to the point where I'm just like, okay, we're just moving along, we're moving along. So if it ever seems like I'm, like, interrupting you because I know I talk Texas fast, but seriously, I literally am not realizing you're talking until later. So, yeah, this is, this is fantastic. And my friend told me that they got AT and which is a shit bird company all around, right? Oh, we got AT&T yeah. here in Clarksville, Tennessee. This is the smallest town I've ever lived in. It's like 100,000 people. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? They're like, yeah, we have AT&T. I'm like, oh, my God. How do I get me some of that? I was like a crack addict. I literally <laughs> called immediately. That on my own for like two hours. I'm like, here's my address. Can you guys get me this? Can you get me this? No, no dice. It's only by the college campus where all the porn and, uh, and studying goes on. So, uh, yeah. Uh, um, anyway. So, is this one of those things where, like, the libertarian has to choose between, um, like, what they really want and, like, what might might potentially vaguely fix a situation but will probably invite more bureaucracy? Like, compared to people who say, who actually, and I don't advocate for this, but people who say, um, let's do a, uh, like, a baseline income for everybody and get rid of all welfare ever, and maybe that'll at least get rid of of the bureaucracy mess, like like there's all there's always an opportunity to argue for like this new regulatory thing because we don't have our dream yet, and I see the appeal of arguing for it sometimes, but I also think it's sort of problematic. I don't know if that's like a comparable type thing in this case. No, I think it's super. I think that's actually I think it the definitely crux is. of the situation. Nice. Yeah, that's a yeah. good summary of the whole crux of the situation. So that's the difference yeah. between, like, yeah. marginal libertarian, uh, yeah, no, like, marginal libertarianism versus sort of staying true to to the long-term goal. Um, and if you ever study, like, social change theory, I have some really great books on it. It talks a lot about which method is actually the best, but who the fuck really knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm into incrementalism, but incrementalism is not actively advocating for a new bureaucracy. That's a little different, a little more dangerous than just saying, let's try to chip at this and that. So that's why I always have a problem with it, that type of angle. I don't know, because I'm not anarchist enough. Yeah, uh, me neither. And I think that's actually, um, that's a really, really good summary, because it's, it's kind of like, 
Yeah, I mean, you're almost going to, um, I mean, we want to we want to be able to promote competition, obviously, but that's not going to happen. So really, mm -hmm. you're asking the FCC, which is a bureaucracy comprised of unelected dinosaurs that have no business right. making these rules to begin with, um, pretty much, you know, you're asking them to do simple things. Don't block and throttle traffic based on your own little preferences. You know, mm -hmm. give us transparency with respect to interconnection. Don't make people pay for prioritization. I mean, that's really all they're asking to do. It, it's not complicated. And, of course, you're going to have all these private interests. But the, the, the funny thing is, too, bless you. The funny thing is, too, um, uh, all these, these uh, individuals who are like, oh, I hate Obama, are suddenly like, yeah, Obama, this is great. I'm like, dude, he's only saying that because he's a freaking total lame duck and there's nothing else. He doesn't want to be the president that goes down and also breaking the fucking internet. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. Seriously. Right? Am I off here? Because, no. He's, he doesn't want to go down that way. Mm -mm. So it's not like it's Obama That's coming up with these grand plans. Come on now. No. He'll, he'll be the mouthpiece and the right. FCC will do his uh, corporate, corporate ownership bidding. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Meg was um, Matt yelling at you about David Friedman because I wanted to bring up sex robots because David oh, Friedman. Yeah, no. Is oh, no, no yelling. <laughs> if anyone is more interested in David Friedman hey. than us, which I don't understand why you would be. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, ironically, <laughs> ironically tonight, um, in three minutes, David Friedman is going to be his badass self and doing a wonderful uh, lecture. And discussion. And if you're not a member of Liberty Me, you can either sign up or do a 30-day trial. And if you sign up, you better use the code antiwar.com, please. Thank you. Yeah. Always. Absolutely. Seriously. Um, um, otherwise, otherwise, you can do a free trial just to watch that. Woo. Or you could stay here and talk with about sex robots. Yep, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen. So, okay, ladies, I have got to know. This is gonna be like the default question, I think, Meg. Do you agree that we ask? Lucy, do you agree that we just like ask people? All right, so oh yeah, no, yeah, no. right, like <laughs> very important. So, question. so let's envision, okay, that sex robots actually become a thing. Give it maybe, okay. So I, I read this amazing little article that kind of piggybacked off of some actual relevant research that actually went and read the relevant research, and it was pretty compelling. So Wait, I was okay. like, all right, so. 20 years, 20, maybe 30 years, 20 tops, 2025, let's put it that way. We, at the earliest, okay, we may actually have legitimate sex robots with, you know, the uncanny valley where the robots get super creepy, right? But then they're actually realistic. So okay. let's talk about non-uncanny valley dipping sex robots. We're on the upside swing of it, okay? So I'm, I'm a little <laughs> bit with Julie Broski on this. Y'all nasty. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so sex, what are sex robots exactly? I mean, is it, I mean, is it what I think it is? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> is this like, too much? I don't know. <laughs> hey, I'm the only one Is, is this what it felt like? like, like <laughs> I need intimacy. <laughs> When the singularity like, comes, they'll be just like a long time ago. I need someone to explain sex robots to me before I can form an opinion <laughs> on this. Okay, okay. <laughs> let me let me paint this picture for you. Oh, okay. when two so, robots love each other. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's imagine that you are single Meg that has never met Matt. Okay, so single lady. Whoop, all right, and instead of dealing with a relationship, dating, whatever you deal with when you're single, haven't been single in a long time, that is completely gone because all you can do is invest 10 grand, maybe even get it on a, a nice little loan, right? And mm -hmm. you can have personally crafted any image of your perfect man, a sex robot that is delivered to you, that is completely programmable that has a uh, warm skin, that looks like a human yeah. being. There is no uncanny valley, okay? Because the uncanny valley gets super, super creepy. George, it does whatever you want. <laughs> I guarantee you, 
It will speak. <laughs> Walk your house naked if you really want it to. It will do many other things that don't start getting me graphic, by the way. But so it will do <laughs> whatever you want. Legalize prostitution. Isn't that that would be great. Cheaper. So what happens to the prostitution market? What happens to marriage? What happens to dating yeah. and relationships when you slowly integrate this into society? If if there are this if the sex laws are literally this comparable, like if, if they're if they really are comparable terrible to human beings and they're actually sentient, then we actually have, well, I mean, I guess we're obsessed with sex as human beings, but, like, we have at least as big problems with the fact that robots are sentient now in our world, in this world. Like, like if, if this has really occurred in this hypothetical, it's not just the sex part of the sex robots we have to worry about. Yeah. They don't have to be sentient, though. They don't have to be sentient. They can be legitimate, <laughs> yeah, non-sentient, programmable robots. Pro no sentient yet. But those are really right now. <laughs> right. No, but not like in high tech. Like, okay, that was a really great point. Yeah, the, Julie's like, do my dish. So, like, bitch. there are already exists. <laughs> this is a good use. I like this. Julie, like, we're on the same page here. <laughs> but I think. So, real dolls already exist. Are you guys familiar with real dolls right. at all? Have you heard of them? Yeah, not that familiar. So they're, robot, they're heavy, though. they feel warm. Right, exactly. But here's the thing. What they do is for people, and this is perfectly okay in my opinion, if you just want to live your life, work at your day job, and have like some inanimate object that provides you a sexual pleasure, be it like a real doll or a vibrator, I am so cool with that because what that will do is remove take people out of the dating pool who don't actually want to have a relationship that um, challenges them or like, you know, where they can actually build like a human connection with someone. It takes them right out of my fucking dating pool and puts them <laughs> over where they're happy and that makes me happy. So yeah, I see this I as like just that. a net positive for society. Yeah, I, I definitely like that take I mean, on it because like, yeah, I, I like having a relationship. I like that connection. I personally would not be the least bit interested in a sex robot. However, there are plenty of people that definitely would be. They don't want that relationship. They don't yeah. want that connection. They just want the release, and that's, that's fine. Yeah. fine for them. All the more yeah. power to them. Just take them out of my dating pool, because I don't want to be like an object that only fulfills those sort of needs for them. So if they can have that, that to me is just awesome because that means that I can focus on finding someone who wants that that real connection um and I mean great I don't I don't see like a huge difference between that and maybe like a vibrator except maybe it provides like I don't know a cuddling experience as well and acts as a vacuum I mean sure <laughs> until the revolution okay I just have to say someone in chat that Robot is offensive to sex robots. They prefer to be called non sentient love partners. Aww. <laughs> if they had a preference, they would be sentient, damn it. If they had a preference, they would be not non sentient. Okay, they're they're robots. Will not answer this question yeah. unless they are sentient. So, what, what, actually exchange, what actually changes if they're sentient, Lucy? Everything in human society. Yeah, I mean, like, then we have like, a, a data or a situation, huge. and like, yeah. <laughs> Like, if, if they're sentient, like, they can't just be your sex robot. I right. Mean, there's going to be some right. yeah, right. robot liberation. <laughs> and then yeah. I'm going to watch all our movies where they kill us all and they're going to get really weirded <laughs> out. Oh, man, it's going to be a big deal. <laughs> we'll probably be dead. In regards to uh, how marriage might change, too, I mean, maybe I'm just, like, crazy sexual, like, hippie right now, but I'm thinking about... If I were in a monogamous relationship um, and I was married, all those times where I didn't feel like having sex because I like ate too much cheesecake or something, and all those times I wish I could just tag someone else in for the night, I mean, that's great to me um, to not have to, to worry about that. I mean, that's why I'm polyamorous. So. <laughs> I was just going to suggest that, but you were way, way ahead of me, so that's good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm too Texas territorial. <laughs> nope, can't do it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I I wouldn't yeah, eat. I need, <laughs> yeah, I need mine. Yeah, sorry, but uh, yeah. But even like a robot. So, 
Like, does your, if your partner watches porn, I mean, how is it different from, like, he uses a tool to get off versus, like, he uses porn to get off? As long as it's not, like, able to replace that human relationship. Mm-hmm. That's why yeah, it's definitely. interesting. That's why, it's, that's why it's so interesting to even uh, presuppose, because apparently in 10, 15 years, it's a possibility way beyond just uh, flashlights. It, it always fascinates me. Oh, what is what is that? Yeah, I mean, actually going out and spending 10 grand on a um, sex partner. I, I'm, I'm going to come from being a guy's girl in Dallas, right? So I spent a lot of time getting a lot of my guy friends laid. And the women there are really dumb. And I don't mean dumb in the sense that they're not educated and that they don't come from money. These are perfectly capable young women that have all of the resources and all of the cunning intelligence behind them to do whatever they want to do in the world. And in but the instead, they'd show, rather be sex robots? They have, yes, basically, succubuses is what I call them. But yes, <laughs> instead they have chosen to prey on men and to go after them for money. You know, what kind of car do you drive? Instead of, yeah, I have a master's degree. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's really demoralizing for any feminist. If you're a feminist, don't go to Dallas, uptown, please, please. <laughs> Noted. Yeah, so, please, don't, don't. <laughs> so um, if you actually look at, like, how, um, you know, women operate in our society, and I mean those types of women specifically, no other group, but that specific group that specifically do whatever they can do to prey on taking from other people, whether that be their parents or their significant other, trying to land a husband, which is a huge hot market in Dallas. I am not over-exaggerating. Whitney, you're in California. Back me up here, dude. Come on. It's like a real thing. Yeah. I'm from Arkansas too. Yeah. Oh, girl. God, God bless you. I'm not even Catholic. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it's really like it. They latch on to men and they will use their sexuality or their womb or whatever to really, honestly, just latch on to a guy. What? When? Yeah, when? Don't you know any bad men? Oh, I know plenty of bad men. Yeah, we're talking. We're always worried about the trophy ladies. Oh, no. We're what about the ones who acquire the trophies? I mean, oh. what about the men who use their riches <laughs> and to not bad have personality? Bad judgment all around. Bad judgment all sure. around. But Maybe but, it's like, a mutual shallowness, though. I mean, well, but, like, what like, it, but what does it do to that, that trade that these young women, specifically this group, right? And they're, they're a pretty sizable demographic living in Phoenix living in now Tennessee, unfortunately, <laughs> and especially in a military town and living in Dallas and, you know, all over the South, California is a big one too, where that's like a culture where it's literally like land a husband who has a nice car who makes a lot of money who like, that's all they're focused on. I am not exaggerating. Hell yeah. There's a shit ton of nasty ass freaking creepy dudes out there, but I'm talking specifically about the chicks, right? If you integrate like sex robots into that, and these men actually only want to procreate selectively, but they just have a biological imperative to fuck. So they're giving in to the succubuses. Doesn't that undermine like, the potential for these women to actually be cure? Like, I'm talking like deep, socio, uh, deep sociology here. What is it? Like sex sociology or whatever? Like, doesn't that like really undermine them? And I kind of like that. I think that if feminism actually means something, it means you don't go to a freaking awesome college and get a great degree and then just go latch on to a husband to steal his alimony. Like, that's a thing where I come from. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but I am, and it's super gross. Uh, I don't know. I think feminism means you do whatever the fuck you want, <laughs> and it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's you us. Other Third way it does. Using your own talent? Do what? But, I mean, the male must be getting something out of it or else he wouldn't do it, right? Yeah. Like, Like, I think that's that's what I'm trying to say, Life choice. I don't personally support it, but I don't think that's the least bit anti-feminist. It might be, but... uh, (laughs) There's... there's, there's, Okay, it's it's a whole whole other thing. Like, there's... I choose my choice feminism, third-wave feminism. Mm -hmm. The Onion article about everything now empowers a woman, like sitting still and eating cake empowers a woman, like getting a high-powered job or being lazy empowers a woman. Um, And then there's like the overly judgmental second-wave feminism, 
And they both have humongous flaws, even barring the like inherent statism of 95% of the feminists. Like, because I think second wave is really, really, really rigid and overly judgmental. And third wave is kind of like, literally whatever you want is empowering, which could be true, yeah, but it I, sort of I, becomes I, pointless in some ways. Yeah, I don't agree that like whatever you want is empowering as a woman. Um, yeah, I think my take on it is like feminism is you should be able to do what you want to do, even if you make shitty like choices. But that's kind of Isn't that just libertarianism? But you can't say it's empowering, like if you're just sitting around eating cake, as you <laughs> noted. <laughs> I mean, unless you derive like a lot of self worth from that, right? Like, I mean, this is why we're libertarians is differing values. Like, that's why we can't have a central planner for li like feminism anyway, like any more than we can have um, a central planner for government. Is I guess that's you true. I have. That. Mm -hmm. I have a really hard time imagining someone like deriving a lot of self value from eating cake, but if they if that's true, okay. I derive a lot of self worth. <laughs> Chicks and cheesecake, that's the next thing. Mm -hmm. I'm it in. Where did Winnie go? Where did Winnie go? Yeah, where did she go? We lost her. She just dropped off and I'm really lost sad. Her. Well, I think she said that she had to uh, bow out a little bit earlier anyway, so we, we got her for a good chunk of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I'm sorry if I went off on a tangent about the uh, creepy twats <laughs> in Dallas, so sorry. <laughs> Apparently it's like a totally foreign planet to you guys. I, I can't, I hope one day we can go to this place together, and I will show you the underbelly <laughs> of what literally the no standard, take what you can get, wave of feminism has caused, and it is terrible. Hey, fuck you, Frank. It's a phenomenal city. Just ignore <laughs> some of the terrible women there. Just ignore some of the terrible women. It's a beautiful city. And if you go to the, the, the parts of Dallas where they're like high-powered executives, everything from that to startup journalists that are women that have respect for themselves, that are not like literally, hi, can I buy you a drink? Sure. What kind of car do you drive? Okay. Um, I didn't come here on a car. Bye. Hi, what kind of car do you drive? Like, I'm not joking. It's that vain and materialistic but and gross. There, there is a counterpoint to that kind of woman in a kind of man whose entire social capital is his richness, and he wants Absolutely. only the haughtiest hottie of all. And ideally, Absolutely. those awful people find each other, <laughs> and we don't have to worry about them anymore. I mean, yeah. that, I feel like that's you know what I don't like? I don't like it. I don't like when those awful people don't get together. So maybe yeah. we need to introduce the next robot to get those awful people together. It's Please, true. that would be phenomenal. That would be great. Like, oh, I'll get seriously. on that. Yeah. Lucy, I need you to Tiffany. really become a mechanical engineer and just make it happen. <laughs> Sex You're robot. Genius. It's on the agenda. <laughs> My communications major will really help with that. <laughs> yeah. Tiffany, um, well, something you said yeah. earlier, like, it was actually really interesting to me. Um, how sex robots might change uh, prostitution and sex work. And I was actually just thinking about this. I wonder if it would take a lot of the the sort of low paying um, jobs off the market for men who are literally just looking for sex. And I wonder if that would change the industry so that like sex workers would have to provide like a more boutique like experience or like specialize or like what sort of things they would have to do just like you know walmart took a lot of things off the shelves so stores had to become more specialized more customizable and find their edges um well don't really higher caliber uh, sex workers provide that though i mean isn't that their whole deal is that like if you are getting like oh, yeah. a really classy kind of lady then you get you like, can have girl a girlfriend experience experience <laughs> yeah exactly yeah Maybe like the like fetishism even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Whitney's back! Yay! Welcome back, Whitney. You're alive. Hello, Hello, man. Man. Sorry, my exactly. computer just freaked out. <laughs> I'll do that. It's all sex good. robot talk. He's mm -hmm. like, whoa! I'm not trying to get yeah. a new USB port. That's just out. how it happened. Retreat, Whitney. Retreat. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Repent. About that is that um. It would obviously be a premium on human sexual companions because even though they are robots, and even regard have you guys ever seen the um, series Orphan Black? Sorry to bring up television. Yeah, I haven't. Phenomenal yeah. show. And it 
really, really good. And if you guys have never seen it, it's really, really awesome. I'm, I'm surprised it's actually not more popular. But um, I love how they portray, like, that whole, like, like sex robot element, right? Where to the touch, like, you almost have to have um, forensic equipment to determine that they're not a, a sex robot. I think that if you reach that high level, like, you've gone way beyond the uncanny level, to where humans can't even decipher the difference, where they walk amongst you, that's a totally revolutionary uh, tenor to society that will be established. But if you have just below that uncanny valley, right up to where you get to the tippy top tier, like they demonstrated, you have this like nice little precipice where American, international, no matter what, like all these people that are sold into nasty sex slave trades would maybe possibly become premium human beings. I don't mean like bad, bad, kidnapping you from your home, selling you from sex slave trade. I mean people that are actively, willingly going into these like actual prostitution rings. Does that make sense? Like, I paraphrase it wrong. I'm thinking as, of Orphan Black as I'm talking. So yeah, like if you actually had like actual rings of people that could prop up human people to be above these sex robots, the one thing that you would want to prevent is <laughs> a total crackdown from a centralized entity of organizing them. So, so are we going to debate wrong. cloning next and sex with clones <laughs> next? Because I feel like that's what we're getting towards there. And, and <laughs> you, you need a new sexy tra uh, transhumanist theme each week. Um, and I guess the uh, I uh, George it. is angry about the oh, robot horse. So, about the robot horse. <laughs> yeah. If this, we could have sex robots that... If sex robots were that advanced, um, I wonder... So they said a decade we can expect some technology like that. I wonder where we're at with artificial wombs then. And how that mm -hmm. can can solve the the abortion problem? Well, that actually. I mean, if that's technology, that, um, I think I solving that issue is a couple centuries away. I don't know. Um, <laughs> solving well, main right. Stream, yeah. Solving it might have been a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, there was actually I think the first baby yet. born through that. Um, I'm actually googling it, and I'm going to link it right here. But I'm pretty sure I read an article about a month ago. But well, hold on, Jacqueline, answer my question. So if you actually had, like, a literally, like, an entire, imagine the Vegas Strip sex, sex workers, right? The Phoenix girls that walk Van Buren Avenue, right? They're all little enclaves. Yep. They're run by pimps, okay? Now you get yep. robots, right? So demand is going to exceed the chick that you've been banging on Van Buren behind your wife's back for the last five years, or the freaking, you know, girl that you're just oh, trying to get off so that you don't give in to your, I mean, men do this. Or give in to uh, to you know avoid your nasty uh, child sex predilections or whatever. These are why people support prostitutes. Or you're just horny and you can't get laid, right? So imagine that these prostitutes transcend that level, and now sex workers are elevated if they're human a little bit up here over time. Mm -hmm. So what becomes the delineating factor between those prostitutes that can be in, that be, maybe be madam above and beyond? Like the actual robot sex prostitutes? Are we getting into the rising sex I think it robot would really, lists all prostitutes? I think uh, it would really depend on um, the the AI technology and whether can the robots learn is like the big question because the big edge that humans have right is we can adapt we can really intuit like what a person wants we can we can be much more customizable maybe not physically but in other more. Uh, I don't know, psychological ways, is the robot able to do that? Um, if it is, that's really interesting. And I'm not sure if it could do that and it was that advanced, I'm not sure there would be a premium on humans. Um, so, yeah. It would take, but like, well, as soon as we get robots like that, though, it's still going to take a long time for them. I mean, I don't know, like ebooks versus like paper. Like paper books are still doing pretty well. Like if we're the paper books and the sex robots are the uh, ebooks, it's gonna take a while to. I've, yeah. I've lost my metaphor. I think. That's a great, <laughs> Sorry, great metaphor. On fire. Really good analogy. Yeah, I like that. I like that oh, a lot. Yeah. So here's the article that um, I was talking about that from the New York Times. I just posted it in the chat that I read the other day about artificial wounds. Um, that also helps people with like mm. infertility issues or people that 
have, you know, like, it's huge. And making that more affordable and more, um, you know, of course, to first world people, unfortunately, um, you know, eventually developing that technology and actually spreading it out would be, holy fuck, an amazing, amazing achievement. So what is your theory on what that would do for actual abortion? Well, I mean, so there's a bigger problem that comes out of this. But if you could literally, um, as soon as you find out you're pregnant, like five weeks, um, have some sort of needle that can take out the, the egg and then put it into an artificial womb where it can be raised, um, that would also, that would allow, um, obviously, for the fetus to become a person, whatever your beliefs on that are, it could develop uninterrupted. Um, the bigger problem would be then what, right? Like that's obviously the the huge issue. But I know from working at the clinic that I worked at at the past, um, the majority of my patients, if that option was a bit available to them, they absolutely would have taken it. Um, I mean, it, it obviously depends on a person's views. And the area I worked in was low income, low education. Uh, so cultural beliefs play into it as well. But I mean, I think that would be awesome to have because a big concern about um adoption is you spend nine months having this affect your body like you have a being like affecting your body your health there there's a higher risk um for for problems in delivery than there is to have an abortion the surgery is actually safer so that's like a huge thing that plays into people concern people's concerns and after carrying something for nine months, how do you not have emotional attachment to it? A lot of things that could be avoided if you could basically get that, whatever it is, out of you really early and have it develop elsewhere. The thing yeah, is, though... Would... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, though, like, is there still, like, there's going to be this transitional period that could last literally centuries where you have people getting pregnant the way that they don't want to get pregnant and you know they still what they need to go to the clinic where you transfer the fetus to the artificial womb so that it can you know grow and it become a proper person it, it's still like you, you the step that you have to take you have to go to a clinic presumably and get this procedure taken care of and it's still like all based on oh no accidental pregnancy sex happened so there's going to be a transitional period of like, well, like some people are doing this and some people are using the artificial wombs and they're not getting the regular abortions and then a zillion other people are. Yeah. And there's, are you going to judge the people who don't use the artificial womb to save the fetus? Like, I don't know. It's going to be, it, it would be weird. <laughs> hey, by the way, yeah, I mean, it really. and I would like to, but we have to stop this recording. Otherwise it will be lost like episode two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's that happens. Um, no, let's continue. We always do a B and B after party. By the way, we'll continue it on. I am ready to have amazing conversations as the rest of you ladies are too. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. You can find this on bnb.liberty.me and also on our YouTube channel. All of these ladies are on uh, Twitter and all of the awesome, amazing social media channels that you can connect to. Thank you so much for bourbon and bitches. Woo woo woo. Okay, continue. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I keep on recording? What the... Uh